Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the Foothill Studios at Foothill College and Cable Access Los Altos, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here is your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. This week, my guest is a technologist who's best known as a Unix guru and a designer of computer-aided software engineering tools. But he's also a sailor, a snorkeling enthusiast, a musician, a hang glider pilot, a model rocketeer, home radio astronomer, microscopist, photographer, holographer, inventor, and father and creator of low-budget, high-tech toys for children of all ages. And so I'd like to welcome a latter-day Mr. Wizard, Simon Field, to our program. Uh, Hello, okay. Simon. And welcome to High Tech Heroes. Happy to be here. Uh, feel free to call me Sherwin. Uh, uh, can I call you Simon? Certainly. Great. Well, where did you grow up, Simon? Uh, San Diego and Claremont, uh, down in Southern California. Southern California. And where did you go to school? Uh, San Diego State University and UCSD. And what did you study in school? Biochemistry and computer science. It was a double major. So they're both at the same time. So you weren't seduced by computers like so many of my friends. Uh, started out in computers <laughs> and another science. Uh, no, they're pretty much simultaneous. Well, that's, that's good, I guess. And uh, what was like your first project? Do you have a project you did in high school or before? Uh, yeah, several projects in high school. Um, I was doing model rocketry and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Built a car that ran on smog. Um, you know, the normal kind of things that high school students do. A car so, that ran on smog? Yeah. Um, I was funding it by asking people to donate 50 cents every time they asked me to explain how the thing worked. So, um, you know, I eventually got enough money together. So a lot of people were of curious friends. as to how this worked. Oh, for sure. It was very smoggy in Southern California, so there's it a lot of fuel is, and I stuff. It still is, I think. Uh, more so, more so then than now. Uh -huh. but, uh, so, so uh, is, how did this thing work? Well, you got fifty I mean, was cents. It, <laughs> well, was it an internal combustion engine, or was uh, it a, no, no? It took turbine, smog in, put smog out, reprocessed you know, the was, smog. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it's going to cost me fifty a, cents to find out, huh? Uh, sure. Well, I guess it's we're kind of low budget. Three wheels. We can, we can afford fifty cents here. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that, those are nickels. There, here you go. <laughs> Okay, there's 50 cents. Uh, now, how did this okay. thing work? Okay. Well, it was a sailboat on wheels. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you tricked me, you tricked all these people, and, and they didn't take uh, their money back? Actually, actually, when they, when they saw the plans and, and things, they were really intrigued. It was, uh, mm -hmm. Everybody loved the idea. Uh, bankers loved the idea. The policeman who gave us the ticket for speeding on it loved the idea. You know, it was, it was You got a ticket for speeding? Yeah, we sort of orchestrated that. So this but, worked very uh, well, I guess. Uh, well, it was a 35 mile an hour zone in the street. Did you so. have any problems with it? Uh, we had one. Um, I remember when we were once uh, moving it from one place to another, there wasn't enough wind to actually sail it. So we were pushing it down the street. There were three of us pushing it, and all of a sudden the thing stopped. And we thought, we checked the wheels, we checked one wheel and then the other wheel, and so they were all spinning and, and working fine. So we all three got back and pushed really hard, and both the front wheels came off the ground. Okay? And so it's sitting here on, the, on just one back wheel. Couldn't figure this out. Okay? We pushed harder, the back wheel came up. Okay? They're all spinning, but the whole thing was off the ground. We finally looked up, and the mast had caught in the power lines. And this was all the, the science geniuses from your school? Uh, of course. Uh, well, I really puzzled them. Um, so, I guess uh, also, I understand you, you built some lasers in high school, is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, built them out of uh, plans from Scientific American's amateur scientists. So um, we had the, uh, the organic dye laser um, that was tunable through various wavelengths and so on, and the uh, ultraviolet laser um, that ran on low pressure nitrogen. Right. Um, so that was a nice one. It uh, it didn't need any mirrors or anything, so it was a very simple uh, mechanism, and uh, put out ultraviolet pulses uh, that we used to 
Um, so they were ultraviolet, so you couldn't see these, right? No. The one, one of the ways we tested it was we put some gas, drops of gasoline in a mason jar, closed the, the jar lid real tight, shook it up, stuck it out in the middle of the street, and the ultraviolet pulses were at the right wavelength for initiating the reaction between gasoline now, let me, and air. Let me see if I understand this. What you're telling me is that accidentally this dye laser that you had, uh, the, was it a, a nitrogen, uh, laser? nitrogen laser? Okay, a nitrogen laser that you had had the right, uh, one of the lines, mm -hmm. radiation lines, was the same as an absorption line for, for common gasoline. Gasoline and air mixture, right. And, and uh, so you were able to initiate a reaction? Yeah. It's like an explosion. Blew up. Right? Blew up. Yeah, we, we only found the lid of the, uh, the mason jar. We didn't find any of the glass shrapnel anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's, that's very interesting. Don't try this at home, kid. <laughs> and uh, what else did you build? You work, uh, I guess, on kites, right? Uh, yeah. Um, in fact, I brought in um, a camera here for putting up in a kite and taking aerial photographs of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I also brought in a, a model of its trigger mechanism here. Um, this is a trombone shaped piece with a loop here and two loops. Now this is a model. This is, yeah, yeah, so the, actual actually... one, the actual one is back here hanging on a string. So no, I don't know. This is see. very small. Yeah. I don't know if we <laughs> well, can see that or let's, not. Let's so this is, and this this is a, okay. a large right. so model. This okay. goes through here like so this. So now the string is here. Right. And this is along the string. And you put a piece of paper on the string, and the wind blows it up and pushes this. And if there's a weight hanging Okay, so say, here, say I have this hanging here. Okay. okay. Then as the... Oh, wait. Now I've got a piece of paper blowing up the string of uh -huh. the kite. It comes up blows here. Up. Hits this. And drops, drops the, weight. the weight. Yeah, now, we used to drop parachutes by just uh -huh. flicking the string, but this is yeah. a mechanism that so, works better, I guess. If there's a weight like this hanging oh. from okay, now so this is a, this is just a, a okay. camera. Right, this is a, a very cheap camera. Um, the string is attached to its shutter release. And well, how cheap is this camera? Uh, about fifteen dollars. Something, $15. something so that if the kite falls down and the camera breaks, you're not heartbroken. Okay. 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 So this is low and budget high. So, break. so the message comes up the string, drops the trigger, and this little fishing weight here drops and takes a picture. Oh well, you develop that after the show. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to be able to have aerial photography like that. I tried to do it with model rockets, and they kept getting stuck in the trees and, and ruining the film. Um, I understand you're also uh, a home radio telescope enthusiast. Uh, yeah, my daughter and I built a radio telescope. Uh, um, this is not something you build every day. I mean, how do you build well, a radio not, telescope Well, it's not the big home? dishes like professionals use. This is a, about a 10-foot long uh, antenna, a very highly directional antenna, like the ones that ham radio um, enthusiasts use. Uh -huh. And uh, it's made out of a 10-foot long piece of wood with um, some lateral pieces of wood like a ladder um, and some aluminum tubing. Big so this is just a directional antenna tubing. that looks like a right. normal TV antenna or something? Uh, it like looks, a boom and a bunch of... Well, well they're not just members. bars. They're, they're squares. Um, and so it, it looks... Um, Quite striking, actually. Okay, each of each of these squares of aluminum tubing goes smaller and small, five percent smaller as you get eight of them in a row. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, in fact, we had it out in the front yard uh, when we were testing it. And big black cables coming uh, back into the house into an FM radio, which was picking up these signals, and. Uh, the neighbors thought that I was setting off electrical storms that had happened the next day because of this oh, big gadget uh -huh, that was uh -huh. out in the front. So how, did, how does this work as a, as a radio uh, telescope? Are you well, point the, at the sky? And yeah, point to the sky and listen to static. And the, the volume of the static, certain stars produce a lot more static. And, and how do you point it? You just others. point it or do you... Um, do you uh, well, this one, we, we aim at a certain, aim certain the, angle, a certain angle uh, point it south and aim at a certain angle and let the rotation of the Earth do the sweep. So the angle, um, so the declination you set and the... Right. What do you call it? Right, right ascension is just the Earth's rotation? Right. Okay. And uh, then there's a computer listening to how loud the noise is and it draws a plot as you go past uh, noisy stars and quiet stars and things. You see this, the plot. So a fairly cheap way to build a radio telescope. Uh, yeah. And uh, I understand... Uh, you're also hol a holographer, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Um, we have one up here. Uh, it's a little hard to see in the, in the camera here. This is one that my daughter 
actually did of a little vase. Uh -huh. um, yeah, we might be able to see it a little bit in there. Some some fuzzy stuff back there. See, I can't. Uh, look at it on the monitor. Yeah, there's a little little spot. You can just vase. barely there see it on go. the monitor. Yeah. Can we rotate it side to side um, so they can get some 3D effect? Or I guess not. Uh, probably. It's passing down. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, you can yeah, see you can some see of the 3D bit, and a little look like a shadow right. there. Well, anyway. Um, so this was a, a fairly cheap uh, hologram to make? Um, yeah. The, uh, the plate costs the most um, money, but the laser light comes through, through the plate, hits something behind it, you know, the object that you're looking at behind it. The light then reflects off of that back onto the plate, and the two beams, the one coming into the plate and the one reflecting from behind, do the interference that makes the hologram. And so that you don't require any fancy lenses, you don't require any, any uh, beam splitting mirrors or, or anything like that. It's a very simple apparatus. OK, well, while we're on the subject of optics, I understand that you built a microscope. Uh, yeah, this is a very special one. This is a model of Van Leeuwenhoek's uh, original microscope. His was actually uh, about 2 thirds this size. So you get the feeling, the idea that they're very small. The, one, the very original first microscope. So now anybody could make this. It's just um, uh, some pieces of brass and some screws. Uh, yeah, this is this is a, a very good lens out of a microscope objective, but otherwise it's all brass, uh, hand threaded and tapped. Um, so they're a set of screws here. And how this does one, how does this work? This yeah. this screw raises and lowers the object. Uh, this screw pivots so that the thing can be uh, mm -hmm. moved left and right. And this screw adjusts the focus. And this screw here allows the object, which is on this little pin here. This, this right. one has a little hole here so that I can put a drop of water and look at organisms. Let me see how this works. Certainly. So now this is the focus right here. Uh -huh. OK, so now I should be able to, to hold this up here, put my finger here, uh -huh. and adjust the focus. Let's see, there's mm -hmm. my fingernail. Yeah. And, and uh, well, yeah, that works pretty well. You can see a little bit of uh, my fingerprint. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, that's pretty good. And uh, I guess you also brought uh, some electric fish and some, uh, you're going to tell us how we can make recordings through a home uh, microscope mm -hmm. with your own uh, VCR at home. And I, I guess we'll get to, to the electric fish uh, as soon as we get back, right after this. First call for help. How may I help you? Mm-hmm. Are you looking for senior services, family counseling, or help in solving substance abuse or other problems? There is an agency that's located right near you, the Bill Wilson Center. Do you need an emergency food program? Do you need to find a first aid or CPR class? Yes, the agency does offer low-cost services. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'd like to help someone you work with or someone you love. When you don't know where to turn, there's United Way's first call for help. Let me give you the agency's phone number. It's 408. United yes. Way's trained referral yes. specialist will refer you to the most appropriate agency to meet your need. If you need further assistance, please don't hesitate to give us a call. It's free, it's confidential, and it's the most comprehensive list of services available. First call for help. United Way, it brings out the best in all of us. Welcome back to High Tech Heroes. Uh, now, my guest, Simon Field, is going to show us how you can use a common everyday magnifying glass to turn uh, any camera into a close-up camera. Simon? Sure. Um, the trick to taking a, a video through the microscope is to get very close to the microscope objective, or the eyepiece, rather. And the way to do that is to take a, your video camera, which focuses normally fairly close, and then put a magnifying glass in front of it, just like you would in front of your eye, in order to make something appear closer. So now, here, we can see that it's much closer than, than this. Now, I've brought in some videotapes that I've done through a microscope of some pond water that was from my fish pond. And, and, and how did you make this? This, uh... Uh, it's very simple. I've got a, a cheap tripod from an old um, toy telescope. I put the camera uh, on top of the, the tripod facing straight down. 
I taped the magnifying glass into the lens hood of the video camera and aim it down the microscope and put a little tin foil around it to cut out stray light. Mm -hmm. And then just play with the, the zoom, get a good picture. And so there really is no microscope. It's just a magnifying glass. Oh uh, no, the magnifying glass is looking at the eyepiece of a look oh, through the okay. eyepiece of a microscope. And well, let's see what this um, looks like. Sure. There we go. Here we have some vorticella. Um, this is going to look a whole lot like um, home movies. Uh, there's a lot of playing with the the lighting under the microscope. Um, it's a lot of. Yes, I can uh, see. Uh, focusing and, and things like that. Um, this is a lot less painful than having to look through the eyepiece of a, of a uh, microscope like I did as a child. Actually, it's, it's very nice because uh, not only do you eliminate all the eye strain and things like that, um, but you can sit there and record and then go off and do something else and come back and watch it all in fast forward and see if there was anything interesting. Uh -huh. And uh, that way, in fact, uh, I was able to catch uh, a large uh, ciliate uh, dividing, um, which is something that I'd never seen before by myself looking through a microscope uh, with my eye. Uh, primarily, I think, because I didn't think, I didn't know how long it took, you know, and so here's this thing that took about a half an hour for the whole process. And uh, Are you able to follow any of these organisms? Uh, that's something that I'm working on. I'm working on uh, having a computer look at this video and as something moves, try to keep it centered with a mechanical stage um, moving the slide around. Uh, but a lot of, the, if you see motion here, it's me moving the slide out around from mm -hmm. under the microscope. Now, um, I understand, I mean, we've been waiting all week because I, I mentioned last week that you're going to bring in these electric fish and I'd mm -hmm. sure like to see them. Uh, sure. Are they, uh, it looks like they're hiding over here in the tank. Yeah. Uh, um, right, these the are elephant nose fish. Mm -hmm. okay. um, give them a little nudge here. Um, there. Um, they look like little dolphins. And they use very small pulses of electricity. Um, there it looks go. like they're sleeping here. Yeah, yeah. They've had a rough time <laughs> in, in transport here to the studio. Um, what I've got here is a little amplifier, that, you know, a cheap Radio Shack amplifier, um, and a couple of wires. Just one wire stuck in one side of the aquarium, another wire stuck in the other side so of the aquarium. So this is just voltage through the whole tank. Um, right. These guys are putting out um, about a thousandth of a volt in little pulses. So this is one millivolt, and, yeah. and the clicking that I'm hearing, is, I, don't know, I don't know if okay. the audience can hear that or not. I, I assume they can. The um, clicking that we're hearing is, is the fish making that noise. Right. Actually, they're making little electrical pulses, and we're turning it into sound by amplifying it and putting it through this little speaker. Um, now, what I have here is a calculator that I've turned into a counter. So it's been running all evening, and now we have 26,930 counts. Um, have some electronics up here that divide the counts by 10. So oh, um, they got excited. So that, yeah, move my hand around. Um, these guys make pulses so quickly that the calculator can't count that fast. So what I have to do is have to tell the calculator to count every tenth count. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh -huh. And what it's doing is it's just pushing the equal button. And so I pushed 10 plus and then equal. And then this electronics here just keeps pushing the equal button electronically. Oh, and so you, you automatically count on this on this calculator. So you right. get a very cheap uh, uh, event counter. Exactly. Out of a, a sharp uh, calculator. Yeah. The calculator was, was selected for its inexpensiveness. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so. Can we make them? Uh, you say that they Please. use these clicks to uh, to locate uh, walls and, and things the same way the dolphins, I guess, use echolocation, use sound. Uh, yeah, they can they can tell um, if there's something alive in the tank versus something dead um, that has a different electrical signal. It alters the the electrical signal in a different way. Um, they can tell when there's another one of them in the tank because they can hear the other fish's pulses, and so they can communicate with each other that way. Um, and now, what makes they, you think that they communicate? 
Um, they put okay. out the same, okay. they put the, the I don't, pulses when there are two of them yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have any direct experimental evidence that says that, that, that they communicate. Uh, in the literature that I've been reading, uh, the males put out different pulses than the females, for example, and males, uh, these are, they're very territorial fish, or not, not this species, but there are other electric fish that are very territorial. Um, and in fact, if you get two fish who are on the same wavelength, mm -hmm. okay, um, there are some fish that will just try to chase the other fish away so that they don't get their signals jammed. And there are other species that will actually shift their frequency away from each other so that they're not jamming each other. Well, that's at least some elementary form of communication mm -hmm. that maybe more occurs. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really interested in these, but it, I, you, I understand you brought one more toy that I'm, I'm really interested in. And if we're going to have time to see it, I guess we're going to have to move back over and, and uh, oh, okay. see it. The bomb in a bottle, as you've been calling. Yeah, well, that's that's what I call it, is a bomb in a bottle. I guess it's it's a great paperweight. Uh, now, okay. how does this work? Um, well, what's going on is here's an, another version of it. I'm trying to get the they they're kind of wet. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Sponging them off here. Um, these are acrylic cast blocks, blobs, whatever, um, that have a cavity in them that holds some water. Um, there's a tube leading from it from mm -hmm. which the water, that's how you fill it with water. Uh, and some wires coming from uh, batteries here that go into two carbon rods that are sitting at the bottom of the water. Right. Um, don't try to see in but, through there. It's well, all cloudy and stuff. Don't but, we have one that's cut away here? Yeah. This one, um, this one isn't cut away as much as it's, uh, it exploded. OK, so now um, don't do this at home, kids. <laughs> so this thing, um, this thing blew up. And this one, this one blew up, yet. right. Now, what you can see inside here um, I think we really have are, to hold it still if people oh, okay. are going to be able to okay. see it. Here. Um, yeah, there are two black carbon rods on either side. And then there is a wire going through the center, or a so pair of wires. So these are the carbon rods here. Right. There's very okay, dark the bottom, little spots right. there. Okay. And electrolysis and then, occurs off of these common rods, or carbon right, rods, I guess, right. from a battery that's just attached, right. a transistor attached radio to this, battery. Right. Uh huh. Um, now get bubbles of, the, of hydrogen and oxygen that fill up the cavity. Fill up this little cavity here, right. and then this little thing that's two wires that come close together yes. like this. Um, those wires have a little spark. Yeah, it's a going spark across. cap. I see. Uh, I and how do you generate the spark here? Um, this is a piezoelectric uh, generator, a spark generator, from a cheap uh, scripto lighter, uh -huh. okay, a little electric uh -huh. uh, cigarette lighter. So uh, this fills up with hydrogen and oxygen, and then the spark ignites the hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. So if you'd like to try it here, just push uh, down on this I don't a couple really know times. If I'm, uh, okay. Go let's, ahead, let's I guess. See. You've done this before. I haven't. Okay. Oh, All good. Right. It didn't work. <laughs> uh, oh. There it goes. <laughs> well, you tricked me. And it rained Maybe all over both of us. Got, uh, <laughs> got a little wet. Yeah. Well, that wasn't too bad an explosion. At least it didn't. Uh, uh huh. Well, the idea is, is a high-tech squirt gun. I guess so. Uh, you can try high this one here. Uh-oh, is this? Oh, that was a good one. Oh, my. <laughs> well, and that's all from a 9-volt battery and a, and a dollar lighter. Right. And some uh, Some plastic. plastic, yeah. Amazing. And my, my notes are all wet now. <laughs> my pants are all wet. And, uh, anyway, well, I have an idea. Uh, HUD, that's our director, HUD Nordine. Um, do you think you could... Uh, do a chroma key with the uh, microscope uh, video that we had. And uh, I guess I want to uh, mention that next week we'll have a space scientist here named uh, Brian Gilchrist. And he and his team of researchers at Stanford believe that they can generate a significant amount of electricity simply by orbiting a wire in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, so be sure to tune in and see a real space scientist next week. And uh, 
I also would like to leave you with this thought. In 1974, a friend of mine programmed the Control Data 6500 computer to write jokes. And this is uh, what the computer uh, wrote. I believe this is the first computer-generated joke ever. It goes like this. Man walks into a bar with a drunk under his duck. Those are no prices. That's my wife. Bartender throws him out. Be, be sure to tune in next week and see the space scientist. And again, thank you very much for being here, Simon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And we, you know, we'd love to have you back and talk in more detail about some of these these inventions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us this week on High Tech Heroes. Be sure to tune in next week where we'll bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in the high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Tony Brzees, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant summer. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes was made possible by grants from Jerry Brown and Associates from Saratoga, California, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California, and Big T Tools of Sunnyvale, California. <laughs>